it a real, you know, I can count a real privilege to um, stand up here today. It's like when I got asked, I thought, man, this is just an awesome opportunity for me. And um, I thought, oh, Heavenly Father, please give me a message because I'm in the group of some people that I really admire. So, so God was really good over the week and he's given me this message. I believe it's straight from the, um, the kingdom and that if you apply it to your life, it's going to radically change you. You know, wisdom is just getting hold of some, some truthful knowledge and just applying it. Now, I, um, I personally don't know everybody here and I kind of like sitting down the back and um, really not getting involved. But after Chrissy's prophecy last Saturday, well, that kind of, that kind of um, what paid all that. And, um, and I got a word that God said to me, you were once involved and then you stopped and now it's time to get involved again. So just for the record, Chrissy, um, I read a one bedroom unit about a few streets back from the beach and surface paradise and the bay windows open up and my bedroom open up over a park and onto the river and it's just it's really perfect I mean it's got a fenced yard and the rent is really cheap and I don't have to pay for the power so I leave the aircon running all day and and, uh, <laughs> and um, after six years of residing with men in in-house ministries I kind of got my own place and I thought oh, this is just bliss so I named my property after um I called it Agilum, after David's cave in 1 Samuel verse 22. And it became my stronghold, and it became my fortress, and a place where I could get uninvolved. The last Friday I was reading a prophetic word from a dude who sent me from America. And I really don't um, usually read much of his stuff because it's kind of a bit out there for me. And, um, but anyway, I thought I'd read this today, and this, this scripture just jumped off, this, off, the, off, the, off the word at me. And I went, oh my goodness. And it says, now the prophet Gad said to David, get up and do not stay in this stronghold, this cave, Agilent. <laughs> Depart and go to the land of Judah. <laughs> and I said, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? And Chrissy prophesied that the next day it's time to stop sitting down the back and get involved. So I've gone from the back row to the pulpit and one way. <laughs> Let me, um, let me tell you about me. Nobody knows me here. and um, So this is me. I, I originally herald from um, New Zealand. And um, I've been in this great country for about 30 years. Now I have uh, certain Australian friends, some of who are here today, who um, like to come up with all these jokes about Kiwis. But I'm going to, um, to state today for them that God sent me to Australia to make Australia a sheep nation. Yes. <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite songs is um, Glory to the King by Darling Chick. It sings about God the Father as the Father to the fatherless and the, the answer to my dreams. See him crowned in righteousness, glory to the King. Uh, comforter to the lonely, lifter of my head. See him veiled in majesty, I cry, glory to the King. And those words have kind of, kind of um, coloured in the picture, that's my life. Now I suppose up to the age of seven I pretty had much a, a normal childhood. Um, the older siblings, I was the apple of my mother's eye. In fact, that love was sometimes the very life that, that sustained her. And um, I had a father who supplied um, and provided for a, a middle class suburban family. But something started to change. Something dark began to start happening to me. I was afraid of this um, this man, Daddy. I had been since I could remember. And Daddy wasn't being Daddy anymore. And his boy stopped being a son and started being an object of uh, a hunk of flesh just to be abused. And at the level of abuse uh, reached a height where I used to lock it away into my subconscious. See, you can never tell anybody what's going on with you because they like to whisper promises in the dark to frighten little boys. And so um, as my spirit began to die in me and all the life of uh, childhood was being extinguished, I uh, retreated inside myself to go to out and cope with the evil that was happening to me. See, I never got a chance to 
play footy or be in a cricket team. Because I was different from other boys. See, I was damaged and then couldn't enter into changing rooms. And I became very clingy to my mother. At least mum made me feel safe. But at the age of nine, that very safety was ripped away from me when my mother died in a car accident that we were in. And I woke up two weeks later out of a coma to a world that became my private hell. So without my mother, our family began to disintegrate and uh, into total dysfunction. My father slipped into alcoholism and his abuses towards me escalated. Now my siblings, siblings left home very quickly. I didn't have an older brother even to protect me. So my father, my father remarried again to a woman who thought that I was nothing but a waste of time and in the way. So I never experienced love as I went into my teenage years. I was troubled, I was angry, I was abused, I'd been abandoned, I was rejected, I was destroyed. And I was just human trash, or in the words of my father, just a disgrace to the memory of my mother. But I had this resolve not to give up. And I went into my teenage, uh, I went into, um, I had this resolve not to give up, but also to survive. And with the earnings from school holidays, um, jobs that I used to get, I bought a car. And I would secretly drive into the city and uh, get a job washing dishes because I was underage and it was illegal, but I just went to it anyway. And, uh, and at, at that time I had a friend who the family help me get an apartment, so I went back to the place where I was raised and I packed the few belongings that I had and I escaped their stinking Egypt that they called family. So as a 14 year old I was unprepared for life, damaged goods, and I was alone in a really big world of strangers. But I worked hard and attended technical training college, achieved high qualifications in the restaurant trade, and I was under the false belief that if I could prove myself, if I could just be a someone, then my dad might notice me in a different light and be proud. As you see, he never turned up and he never sang my praises because I was the black sheep. And I kind of thought, well, you ain't seen the black sheep yet. So I entered into the nightclub arena. And I got behind the bar and I started pulling beers and I started pulling chicks and um, I immersed my soul in rock and roll. And then somebody gave me a pill, just a little pill, said to take all my pain away. And it did. And I liked it. I liked it a lot. Gunja, acid, amphetamines, and in the words of Stevie Nicks, cocaine became my own personal gold dust woman. So in the 1980s, it was kind of like every boy's dream, sex, drugs and rock and roll. In fact, that lifestyle managed me to afford me not to see daylight for the next seven years. The 1980s club land was very violent in Auckland. It was run by um, organised mafia, uh, run by drug lords. The streets were awash with heroin, thanks to Mr Asia. And um, fast cars and fast money and fast women. And that TV show, Underbelly, was really just a parody to what I saw and was a part of. And then New Zealand became too small for me. So I needed new horizons. So I flew into Sydney and found Sydney Cross in an hour. And then five years later, a drug addict and an alcoholic. In the decades of the 90s are nothing but a blur to me. I got married to a dysfunctional woman, had a daughter. But the nature of the beast even stole that from me. I got drifted in and out of addiction, got married again, drifted in and out of addiction. I was a broken, I had no identity, no hope, no future, no direction, and I was just the living and dead. By, the, by 2007, I, my health had deteriorated to such a degree that a doctor's report gave me five months to live, maximum. And I was bloated and the disease junkie, but somehow I entered a detox unit on the Gold Coast and this social worker said one word to me. She said, Jesus, and I went, well, no, not today, I'm not. And so she said, no, you need Jesus. And on my release from detox, she contacted this Christian discipleship rehab, and by the grace of God, what I know now is my window of opportunity. See, I used to deal drugs up and down the Gold Coast Highway, 
and this is this building on the corner of Monaco Street that's got this massive big sign on it says Our Message Jesus. And it just it just used to annoy the crap out of me. I'm gonna go back and burn that mother down. <laughs> but wouldn't you know it, on the day of my release from detox, I ended up in that building. <laughs> You know, that is where I found the Holy Spirit to refine this fire, and he did a complete number on me. It was where I met my God, it was where I met my Saviour, it was where I intimately fell in love with my Lord. The only burning down that happened in that building was my ungodly existence. And, and God reached down from heaven and he rummaged through the dung heap of broken humanity and he chose me. And he began to love me and confront me and challenge me, teach me his ways and break those chains off the body of death that had chained me up for 30 years. And the dross rose to the surface so the Creator could skim it off so he could see his reflection in me. I grasped hold of this Jesus and I surrendered to his grace and to his sovereign power to deliver, to heal, to redeem and to restore. And I met my daddy, my true daddy, Abba Father, the father to the fatherless, the lifter of my head, comforter to the lonely, the answer to my dreams. See, he took away my heart of stone and he gave me a new identity found in him. And he empowered me with a divine revelation of grace that I'm chosen with a plan and a purpose not to bring harm, not to do me harm, but to give me a hope and a future. Yes. And, in, and in the words of Toby Mack, he declares, I was made just for him, made to just love him, made to adore him. I was made to love and to be loved by you. <laughs> so 2 Chronicles 7 14 declares, If my people are called by my name, and humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And today, this is evidence to my life. Ladies and gentlemen, I am 51 years old. I look like, I look like I'm in my 30s. I feel like I'm in my 20s. I live my Christian life with the reckless abandonment of a teenager, but I come to my Heavenly Father with the faith of a child. So in my... So, so, so just, just the, the bottom line is, I love Jesus, and in the end of it, I just cry glory to the King. I mean, Galatians 5 verse 1 says this, it's for freedom's sake that Christ set us free. Yes, yes. I remember thinking, okay. what am I going to do with my freedom? Yeah. So it comes down to two things. Yeah. Number one, to know the heart of God in Jesus. And number two, to know my own heart in Christ's light. So in my quest to know him, I recognise that Jesus loves people. All people. Especially those that society doesn't. <laughs> Therefore, I began to understand how far he would travel for men. Yeah. For that is the same distance he would journey again through me for others. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. So three months out of reading, and it's like did not have my life together. But anyway, God, you're in control. I pioneered a rehabilitation centre in Palm Beach. And over an 18 month period was instrumental in seeing men set free, who in turn rose to leadership positions to set up people free. During this period I also ploughed the spiritual ground in Malaysia for a rehab centre to be established over there. Awesome. I was um, at an ACC pastors conference uh, one day up or a couple of years back and this pastor was an inquisitive of my rock star image. And he, uh, he, said, he wanted to know who I was, so I told him. And out of that, he pioneered a rehab centre in Harvey Bay. See, I've been a curriculum advisor in the restoration for the addicted. I then travelled to Los Angeles Dream Centre, came home with a vision, and I implemented a 16-bed homeless men's shelter here on the coast. I pioneered a doctor block community program, a community food bank. I re-established a Feed the Homeless outreach on Saturday. Yeah. And I still believe 90% of those outreaches are still going strong. Come on. See, for one year, I was in rehab. 
for five years I was in ministry and on the seventh year I rested. But in the resting period, God changed my calling. See, the journey I am now on, the road that I'm traveling is called more the prophetic and deliverance ministry. But that God reminded me that deliverance ministry is one of the hardest ministries of all. Yeah. And when I was told that, I said, God, why do I always get the hard ones for? <laughs> and he didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so this is who I am. This is me. This is what I do. See, I love my Jesus. But when it comes to the Jezebel spirit, well, I'm a loaded gun. <laughs> You know, I, uh, I once said to a woman who was clearly evidenced um, that she was influenced by a Jezebel spirit and she just didn't like me for some reason. And I said to her, because my, my full name is David Bright, and I said to her, do you know that my name is in the Bible? I said, do you know my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life? And she goes, where? I says, in Revelation 22 verse 16, it says, I am the root and descendant of David the Bright and Morning Star. <laughs> <laughs> so, what she, so what she said, <laughs> oh, they're talking about Jesus there, and I went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear the little slam, she flew out. <laughs> now, also, I'm no great fan of the religious spirit. When I'm around a religious spirit, it's like pouring vinegar on caustic soda. Um, I'm finally quite reactive. <laughs> and uh, part of my rehab involved a large learning of Christianity. And in its teachings and its morning devotionals and going to soap meetings and church twice on Sundays, well, church was quite an eye-opener for me. Now, uh, don't get me wrong, uh, the worship was off track. I mean, the, uh, the worship pastor was more extreme looking than I was. But when she spoke, it was so angelic. But over a period of time, I, um, I noticed that something was not right. I had read this Bible, and these are well-to-do, knowledgeable Christians. It didn't add up to what the Bible said they should be. I mean, 50% of them were sick, 75% uh, of them were stabbing each other in the back, and 90% uh, of them looked like they sucked on a box of sour lemons. <laughs> And I mean, don't mention the word tithe, because you'll get a reaction like you're out the So I would stand down the back of my arms while they're going, I think I'm not becoming a part of this. I mean, I didn't want admission to some Christ-flavored cappuccino set Christianity. I wanted son adoption into the kingdom. Come on. See, seasoned professional Christian leaders would try to manipulate me with religious cliches saying, you need to get into the spiritual river. This is a river church. Get immersed. Come on in. The water's fine. There was no river. There was a damned up, non flowing sewer of people swimming around in each other's sin with bad attitudes and ungodly character. And you, and you want me to get into that? Are you off your cracker? See, it was unholy and it was a bride that was spot and with wrinkle. And every church I've attended who are under that banner had the same behaviour, the same spirit, different location. And this is what I want to speak on today. This is my message, and it is titled, The Beauty of Holiness. So turn to your Bible, to 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. And while you're doing that, I remember when I was in rehab, in the first two weeks, I had to learn the names of the 66 books of the Bible from beginning to end and recite them back without making a mistake if I wanted to graduate into the first stage, which is really hard when substance abuse had paid you back with short two memory loss. <laughs> so, 1 Peter says, as obedient children, do not conform to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your behaviour. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Yeah. See, 
Holiness has become, almost become a bad word among Christians in our time. This is usually because it's associated with movements and teachings that are legalistic in their approach to this crucial aspect of our spiritual journey. Even so, not only is holiness fundamental to true Christianity, we are exhorted in Hebrews 12 verse 14, pursue peace before men and the sanctification which no one will see the Lord. See, sanctification is often interchangeable with holiness, which means to be set apart, purified. This is one of those hardline scriptures. It's an absolute. We must be holy if we're expecting to see the Lord. For me, all I want to hear on that great day of judgment is, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. It also helps me to answer the question I've inquired of the Lord many times when Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then he will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Yeah. See, recent studies indicate that there is no longer a measurable dis difference between the morality of those who claim to be born again Christians and non-Christians. Christians are now sliding into debauchery so fast, soon Christians, when measured as a whole, be less moral and have less integrity than unbelievers. What is more shocking is there are no alarm bells that are being sounded from every pulpit and meeting place in the land, except probably from here. To the world now has grounds to justify calling Christians hypocrites. A hypocrite is someone who claims to believe or do one thing, but then does another. Let us also remember that Jesus himself reserved his fierce denunciations for hypocrites. If you're going to church and claiming to be Christians, but are doing things that we know the scriptures condemn, we are the ones that he was talking about. We are the ones that are bringing shame to his most glorious name. And for me, for everything that he has done for me, I've chosen not to go that way. Statistically speaking, 3% of Australians' population are committed Christians. It makes Australia fall into the category a heathen nation by world standards. And the very people group, spirit-filled Christians, God has entrusted to get Australia safe, are missing the mark. And I believe we all will be held accountable. See, the psalmist of Psalm 24 poses this question to us. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in his most holy place? It is he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up to the soul to falsehood, falsehood, and has not sworn deceitfully. See, to ascend towards God, or to, I believe, I believe that Christian needs to understand, we cannot find the hill of God, let alone send it if we're caught up in deception. I believe today to ascend towards God is a walk into a furnace of truth where falsehood will be extracted from our souls. As each and ascending step upon the hill, God will thrust our souls into greater transparency. Yes, yes this is the hour where the body of Christ really needs to seek holiness. A true holiness arises from here. It comes from a spirit of truth which unveils the hidden places of our heart. Indeed, firstly, it is truthfulness which leads to holiness. You see, there's an antidote and it's found in Matthew 5 verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. I believe if we're to be truly set apart, purity must be of utmost importance. It must be the only option. See, Psalm 119, verse 9 to 11 poses this question. How can a young man keep his way pure? 
by keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. No matter what your age may be, we keep our way pure by keeping it according to God's word. In this day, we need to move beyond where we are at and give the word its rightful place, our most treasured possession. Yeah? We need to love the word as it pierces as far as the divisions of soul and spirit. To treasure the word is to remain fully vulnerable, vulnerable, even as it judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The word exposes our motives. It is a lamp of the spirit which illuminates the darkness of our hearts with light. It sets us free from the strongholds of hidden sin. It wounds, but it also heals, penetrating deeply into the very core of our being. It's time to let the Word of God crucify us. I mean, I began to tremble when I read 2 John verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of the Christ does not have God. My jaw kind of hit the ground when I heard that. It's a wake-up call. God's getting serious. We need to stockpile in our minds more of the Bible than we have ever before. Because the reason is, sin wears a cloak of deception. But really is the process of deception apparent. The enemy lies to enter our minds with whist and whispers, not shouts. That it walks in darkness, not light. And with all sin, there is enough pleasure in it to make it attractive. Because if sin was without pleasure, only the mentally deranged would commit it. <laughs> For sin also contains death. Yes. Thus we must vigilantly take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Yes. Yes. If we would discern the voice of iniquity, we must recognise its lie when it says, Our sin is not so bad. God understands. <laughs> For those who do not love the truth of God's word, God allows a deluding influence or an activity of error. Say if you are a slave to lust, your thought life and consequence, but consequent behaviour will be filled with secrecy and condemnation, which is an activity of error. You may look wholesome outwardly, but your mind is clouded by the looting influence in this area. If we are a slave to fear, our thoughts and deeds will be in a constant state of vigilance against calamity. This vigilance is an activity of error. If we are a slave to our appetites, and your many trips to the fridge, if you haven't already positioned your fridge next to your Jason recliner, <laughs> and those wonderful stories you tell everybody about your metabolism, it's a delusion. It's an activity of error. It's imperative we flee falsehood. Let us ask ourselves, are we merely seeking to be saved or are we seeking to be like Jesus? If our salvation does not centre upon the goal of becoming Christ-like, we will quickly fall into dead works and empty deception. See, holiness is not a means of earning salvation. It is the proof you have received salvation. Yes. See, our salvation is a person. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. It has been conformed to his image that saves us and makes us holy. Yeah. Let me say it again. Salvation is a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. It has been conformed to his image that saves us and makes us holy. And while the word holiness means to be set apart separate, a possible interpretation of the Hebrew root, root word kodesh is to be bright, clean, new, and untarnished. Holiness produces separation from sin. But mere separation from sin cannot produce holiness 
It is not the absence of sin that produces our sanctification. Holiness comes from the presence of God. We may avoid touching what is unclean, but if we are not united through love to the fatherhood of God, we are, all we will have is religion. Yeah. Christ in us is our holiness. For as close as our relationship is with him, to that degree we reflect his holiness. So what does a holy life look like? Jesus says, a tree is known by its fruit. If we want to know if our doctrines are good, examine the fruit it produces in our life. The Holy Spirit in the life of a believer should produce a holy life. Yep? The scriptures tell us the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If we think we are walking in the Holy Spirit in discernment and in gifts, yet lack the love and the joy and the peace of the Holy Ghost, we may be only walking in a false religious spirit. We are able to notice how holy we are becoming, but we are not becoming holy at all. We are becoming religious. Because holiness, holiness doesn't notify, it doesn't notice itself. Holiness is a tree with its laden with spiritual fruit, a tree rooted in the presence of God. You know that scripture that says that the angels in the last days have come back to, to separate the tears from the wheat. Because you can't tell the difference. The angels have to I've worked out how you tell the difference. See, wheat will be bending over full of fruit. Hum. But a tear stands in pride, looking like, looking like how good am I? That's, right. That's how you tell. Indeed, when religion continues to splinter in divisions and strife, holiness, that very essential nature of God, that will bring forth fruitfulness, healing, and unity. How we need true holiness. For today we live in a world where church is divided from church and believer from believer. If the Holy Spirit was allowed to truly rule, there would be repentance, healing, restoration, and love. There would be true and lasting miracles. The separation we see in Christianity today is evil. It is a sin which needs to be repented of before Jesus returns because it's religious. I believe, me personally, I believe there should be one church in each community, a multifaceted church, true church, which allows it meet, allows it, although it meets in different buildings, is yet united in spirit with love with one another. That is what Jesus prayed for in John 17, that we would all be one. See, remember this, religion is a God of its own. Jesus never said we would be the denomination of the world or a sect set on a hill. He said, no, we have to be the light of the world, a city set on a hill. When we are holy, we will be more concerned with people than we are with religion, and we will, in fact, reflect the compassions of the king. Hey. Hey. Amen. See, yeah. the Holy Spirit, who is the personification of the holiness of God, by his very name, is also our helper. See, God does not require us to do anything that he will not empower us to do by his Holy Spirit. However, we must understand that this is his name for a reason. If we want the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our life, we too must be holy. Because the Holy Spirit will not dwell in an unclean vessel. The true key to living a holy life is not just determining we are going to stop what we know is wrong, but simply returning back to our first love, Jesus. That is why the Lord summed up in the entire law of Moses the two commandments, to love God and to love our neighbours. If we love God, we will not worship idols or do things that offend Him because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If we love our neighbours, we will not, will not murder, steal, envy, or not. 
if we live a life devoted to loving God and our neighbours, we will do not do wrong things. The Lord replaced all of the do nots of the law with positives. Love God, love one another. Because when we do that, we fulfill all of the do nots. See, true holiness is not motivated by fear, but it's motivated by love. The Lord is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. Without spot speaks of moral purity. Without wrinkle means to be perpetually youthful. The reason the bride wants to be without spot or wrinkle is not out of fear that if she is not perfect for her bridegroom, he will smite her, but because she is so in love with him that she wants to be perfect for him. This is the difference between being driven by legalism, which is fear-based, and being driven by holiness. Legalism will just age us fast, making us just like old wineskins which are no longer flexible enough to hold new wine. Yes. So, in conclusion, this is the reward. And I found it in Isaiah 35, verses 8 to 10. And it sums up the way of this, this way of life perfectly. This is the beauty of holiness. And Isaiah says, and a highway shall be there, a roadway. And it, could be, it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it, but it will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not be found there, no lion will be there, nor will any vicious beast go up on it. These will not be found there, but only the redeemed who walk there and the ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing, everlasting joy will crown their heads, gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. Yeah? Yeah. The highway of holiness is the way to God. There's a way of life in which all our judgments, negative consequences and the problems of a sinful, unclean life, those things that have brought death into our world, are eliminated from our lives. No unclean, no lion, no vicious beast will be found there. Much of the spiritual warfare that is fed upon our ignorance, unbelief and sinfulness is simply non-existent for the whole. To those who choose to walk towards holiness, they will, be, they will be complete in the knowledge that they are redeemed and they are ransomed. With an attitude that you are crowned with everlasting joy. Abounding in life, that's our portion. That's why we become Christians. I think I have um, tried to, uh, to address probably what I would consider the most important issue in a Christian's life and Christianity today. It's that serious. Let us all grow up in all aspects into Him. And the fullness of the Spirit will be our nature. Walking in holiness is the foundation of a godly life and it's the ultimate goal. This is the essence of our purpose for being, that our lives are evidenced by an ever-increasing harvest. And let me end with this. What you, do, what you do may be noteworthy, but what you become will last forever. You see, the thing is for me, because I'm the patriarch of my family. In my family line, I'm the last male child. I'm the only Christian left in my family. And through my beautiful daughter Felicity and my meek, patient, kind, gentle son-in-law, they have given me three perfect grandchildren. My three-year-old daughter, granddaughter, Ariana, she's just a diva and she knows it with her beauty and pearls. My youngest grandson, who is two, his name is Theo, and I learned in Bible college that Theo, Theos, means a manifestation of God. Burning bush is a manifestation of God. Yeah, but, but my, my Theo, who's two year old in those terrible twos, he's manifesting everything but that at the moment. Yeah. And then there, is, then there is Emmanuel, my five-year-old firstborn grandson, 
my daughter named him Emmanuel David because God is with us in our family. And the Bible tells us in both the Old and New Testaments that the first male child that opens the womb belongs to God. It also tells us out of the line of David will come a Savior, and his name will be called Emmanuel. See, these are my inheritance, these are my crowning glory. And it's my role to leave my children's children an inheritance, a godly legacy. So as the head of my family, I have to walk in that which is holy, righteous and pure. And it just took me 51 years to work that out. <laughs> and that holiness and righteousness and purity will flow down from the head to every part of my family, to future generations. That I stop the grip of Satan and death in my lifetime so the next generation will walk in power and the fullness of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what my life is about. So that's it. God is good. Amen. Yeah.